Before I begin all this, I'm going to ask you to play the mental game for me. In this game, I want you to think of anything except a white horse. My psychology professor told us to play this exact game as a means of learning something about our memories and our mind. The object of the game is to think and go as long as you can without thinking of a white horse. Some people try to distract themselves by thinking of other things, and some just try to blank their minds of everything. Just keep those results in the back of your mind. I am a student at Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland. My major was psychology, and before you go about judging me, I had a practical use planned out for my major. I wanted to be in and a logical therapist, please don't combine those words, who gave therapy sessions to the less fortunate. Before all that could happen, I had to pass my senior year in college, and that meant coming up with the original study for my senior capstone project. I didn't want to get in depth into the field of psychology for fear of alienating the less knowledgeable or less interested. But just so the reader knows, there are a lot of different branches of psychology, and I was interested in Junjian psychology. The major difficulty was that my professor was a Fundian psychologist, and he directly influenced my senior capstone experience during his authority. I had originally wanted to focus in the Jin Junjian archetypes for their role in dreams but my professor had steered me in another direction. He instead wanted me to focus on subconscious and its impact on human behavior. It was unfortunate, but my desires to pass quickly outweighed my interest and I found myself carrying out my professor's study while he was masquerading it as my own thesis project. We debated on multiple possibilities we could employ to better know the collective unconscious that he insisted on calling the ID, a Fudian term to define hidden part of the mind that is made up of impulsive desires. We butted heads a few times on this subject because of our Fudian and Junjian roots. I wanted to study the collective unconscious, a portion of the psyche that is interconnected of all humanity in common, referred to as inherent knowledge of prof and Professor Pankajeff wanted me to focus on the ID, subconscious desires. This difference created an ever persistent rift between us. It heavily impacted my study. I wanted I had wanted to study a series of subjects to better understand my concept and Professor Pegajeff was more interested in doing the case study using a single person. We bickered about this for so long that the due date for my senior thesis snuck up on both of us and I had to relent and accept his idea for studying on a single person. Due to the slow start, there were no valuable participants and I had to volunteer myself as a subject of the observer. I'm going to explain the process that we use to try to contact the subconscious, my subconscious. We use Franz Anton Mesmer's concept of, of animal magnetism and trance-like states to put me into a somnambulistic state. The closest thing I can compare it to was be hypnotism without the cliche pocket watcher phrases like you are under my control and will do my bidding. I know it sounds like bullshit, but to see it in action is another thing entirely. When I went in for the first session, Pro Professor Pekajeff was waiting for me in the Richard Matheson book in his lap. He continued to thumb through it while I set up my camcorder to record the session. I sat down, he closed the book and said, Are you ready to make a long distance call? All you have to do is pick up that phone. I shrugged my soldiers. He had a tendency to make little-known book and movie references a little smarter than he was. To feel smarter than he was. He started the session. 
My next conscious moment was Hank just snapping his fingers in my face. I sat up slowly and inquired about how the session went. He said it a deadpan manner. Turns out you're crazy. I gave another shrug. Tell me something I don't know. We reviewed the session and I was disappointed. I guess I had thought that he would have a breakthrough or some big revelation about the human mind, but it was just 30 minutes of me looking dead eye and mumbling responses of our planned out questions. That happened for the next two sessions as well. He would put me in a trance and, I, and ask a battery of questions like, How do you feel? What do you do in your free time? And what are you thinking about now? He would follow up with the moral quandary questions that gauge my ethical understanding. After each session, I would sit down and record my findings in a red journal I had brought in a nearby store. I responded to the few first few sessions in the same dopey manner, giving only one more responses to the questions. I was getting ready to abandon the whole project until the fourth session. I was brought out of the session with Professor Pegasus snapping excitedly in my face. What happened? His only response. Something amazing. I sat down and watched the recording with bated breath. It began normal, but at the beginning of the question, I responded more or less as day. How do you feel? I feel great. What do you like to do in your free time? Whatever I'm feeling at the moment. He started, he was about to ask the third question when I sat up from my bed and explained that he thought I had woken up until he saw that my eyes were just as glassy as before. I answered the moral quandary questions in a self-serving manner. I said I would have to keep a wallet I found on the street and told no one. I ignored people that were broken down on the side of the road and I agreed to take food out of the lobby fridge even without permission. Pankajeff spoke excitedly. I think we did it. I think we got in touch with your base, baser desires. Five or six more sessions and we should really be onto something. He shook my hand and we planned our next session. I was really pumped about the whole thing, and a, a case study like this may be enough to be actually published in a rhetorical psychology journal. We could be closer to understanding the mind. The next session started off differently. Professor Pankajeff sat me down and told me that we were going to try to create a pavilion trigger and made it easier to slip into the transit state. If I imagined a certain object before every session, we could make it easier to go into a trance state so we could have more time to explore the ID. I wanted to correct him and say collective unconscious, but I bit my tongue. I told him that I would imagine a white horse in my mind before every session. He grunted. The Junjian archetype is for instinctual urges and basic desires? Have it your way. I spent a, a half an hour before every session thinking about a white horse in the hopes of expediting the project. A few sessions later, and the pavilion response were really starting to work for us. Thinking of a white horse calmed me down and helped me enter a hypnotic state more expensively. We continued to get intriguing responses from the mesmer itself. We spent hours planning out what we would ask. I recorded all my responses in a red journal for future reference. On pure whim during one of the sessions, as I was slipping away to the state where I could commune with all my collective unconscious, Professor Pankajeff asked me what I was seeing. My response was so intense and unnerving that I sat down and transcripted it here. I don't know what influenced me to say what I did, but it sounded vaguely Lovecraftian that it, it alarmed me. I'm sitting in a room facing a window. What's beyond the window? I am at the edge of the rift staring into immutable darkness looking 
into the yawning abyss whose significant depths have never been plumbed before. I want to look away, I want to shriek at what I'm seeing before a malformed abortion shrieked for me. The home nuclei screeched as something tumbled up from a void, disgorged from their withering, mutilating mass. It was entangled in the creaking, copulating, clashing amalgamation, and it has felt my gaze and is approaching, detangled from the writhing forms. It moves towards me, the lurching but vaguely human gait. What does it look like? It is here. In the tape, my eyes glazed over, and I entered that familiar fugue state. I must have watched and rewatched the tape five times. I couldn't figure out what it all meant. Each time made me shiver. Was looking at through the window into a chasm, like peering into my subconscious? If that was the case, what were those writhing masses? Were they subconscious thoughts comp competing to make their desires known to me? If those things were humiculi, as I, as I so inclusively put it, were subliminal thoughts? Was what was that one that rose into my conscience? I decided that my next session with Professor Hank Jim, I would bring this up and see how it feels. I am not sure why I wanted this, but I had the urge to ask him if I could be restrained during one of the sessions. I think it was just how I described the whole thing like as a shadowy figure that made me feel such a sinister. nerved me the most. As I walked through the campus country yard towards the psychology lab, I took in the temperate environment and f revealed in feeling the warmth of the sun on my skin and for the first time in months. It was the first warm day we had had in months and it was greatly affected by my moral I think it was the dark, dreary, and cold weather that was so profoundly influenced my mental state. I felt reinvigorated. I realized I had spent so much time indoors writing notes, I barely and barely eating anything. Winter was finally waning, and the students were out in droves and celebrating the change in seasons. Students were throwing frisbees and basking in the sun. A few had even brought out the radios and were listening to the campus station. Students ran the radio station every now and then. They would play old songs from the 80s. I was walking by when I heard a snippet of a song with a catchy kind of electric beat. It went like this. If you want to be rich, you gotta be a bitch. Don't ride a white. I walked out of earshot of the music and kept going on my way towards the psych lab. I was a couple of yards away from the building when I started to feel dizzy. My head swam and my vision seemed to grow blurry. I managed a few more steps before collapsing onto the stairway that led to the building. I woke up in the hospital with a pounding headache and overall feel nauseous. The nurse calmly informed me that I had to take better care of myself. I had apparently passed out from exhaustion. I told her that I was working on my thesis and I had and I had neglected myself a bit to get completed in time. I was released on my own recognize. I went home and sent an email to Professor Pankajev explaining what this my situation. I told him I was going to take the next day off to get myself back in health. I went to bed and woke up the next day. I felt better. My the nausea had passed and my feelings of fatigue was gone. Professor Pankajev hadn't responded to the email, but I knew he had a tendency to read an email and not send anything back confirming. I would show up in the lab the next day and schedule another session with him. 
I watch some old sci-fi B movies on YouTube and relax for the rest of the day. I went to the psychology lab the next day, listened to my apology, all prepared in my mind. Typically, I could find him in his laboratory with the DSMIV book laid out in front of him, or grading paperwork. He wasn't there. I went to his office and found the door closed. There was a note on the door. Our calm, I, it calmly stated that he was taking a leave of the absence to deal with some family issues. My heart stank at, sank at reading that. I had wanted to discuss the reference. What I had said during my last trans state. I got in contact with the co-chair of the psychology department who advised me to review our notes and begin compiling the results while I waited for him to return. She seemed slightly disappointed that he had left on such short notice, but was understanding of the situation. She gave me a couple of weeks extension and expressed her interest in seeing the final results of her study into the subconscious mind. I went back to my room and began focusing on writing the thesis. The notes I had written about our sessions and my hypothesis flowed easily out onto my computer. Before everything was said and done, I was on page 20 and I had supported my hypothesis of the Jungian concept in, of collective unconscious with multiple psychologists, both current and antiquated. After that, I began watching tapes, the tapes. Now I found that whenever I watched the tapes of our session, I was extremely anxious. Things that I had said while in my trance state had seemed harmless, albeit selfish earlier, now they were tainted in almost sinister quality. The line that unnerved me the most was the fifth session when Professor Pankajif asked me into my trance state, what do you do in your free time? To which I responded, I do what I always wanted to do. I spent those days writing and reviewing my thesis only to I only had the conclusion left and was fairly certain I would complete it in one or two more sessions. I was glad that Professor Pankajif had decided to set the camera to record after I had been put into a trance state. It saved some time and it seemed disconcerting to me, the idea of drifting out of consciousness and commune and with my unconscious. I was also secretly glad he had decided to take some time to deal with family issues. This whole experiment was beginning to feel ominous. A few days later, I decided to swing by and see if Professor Pankajif had posted any update. There was nothing that new there, but I did have an interesting encounter with another student. She saw me hanging around his and asked me, You've been working with Professor a lot lately. Do you know when he's coming back? How would I know? She was caught off guard for a second before responding. You were the one who put up this message up at his door. I thought he must have told you something when he would be back. My heart started to beat faster. I asked her the question despite realizing how crazy it sounded. You saw me put up the note? She raised her eyebrows and answered, Yeah. Are you alright? You look pale. I told her how I had passed out about two weeks ago and was still recovering. I told her that I didn't know when Professor Pink Jeff would be back, but I would try to find out. I found out her name was Teresa, got her email address, and we parted ways. A horrible thought was festering in the back of my mind. It didn't take much work to get into the Washington College website and look up Professor Pinkajif's information on the directory. I tried calling his home number, but there was no answer. I reasoned with myself that he could have been out of or away from the phone. I called him two or three more times with the same result. I proceeded to look up his home address using his phone number and decided to drive down to his house. Unsure of what I would I what I would encounter there. 
I was, it was a 20 minute drive that gave me a lot of time to let that horrible thought faster and grow unfestered in my mind. I knocked on his door, but there was no response. I knew I was overstepping my boundaries, but I had to know. I turned the knob and found it was locked. I looked around the yard and found a key under a succubus white rock. I unlocked the door and opened it almost immediately. My nose was assaulted by a sickening smell. I lied to myself and prayed that it was just the odor of an ill-cumped house, but I knew better. I found him in the kitchen. It appeared like he had opened the front door and had fled in terror back into the kitchen looking for some means to defend himself against the assailant. He could have just tripped or been dragged into the center of the room where he had been brutally beaten by an old metal coffee pot. The vicious of the attack left his face in a broken mass and looked to be abstract pain. I don't know how many blows it had taken to kill him, but I knew that the assailant had kept beating him after he had died. The pot was discarded next to his bloody, bruised, and petrified corpse. He must have been dead for at least a week. My worst fears became a reality when I turned from the broken and brutalized body to see that someone had painted something on the back of the front door. I could only stare at the abject horror as those pieces all clicked into place. Painted on the door with using white outlines of the outline of a white horse. It was painted so it looked like it was a mid gallop. The image scared me more than the thought of the professor's body pulverized with a blunt object. As I watched the white horse outline on the door, I started to feel dizzy. And at first, I thought it was just a shock of setting in, and then I realized it was a supreme moment of terror that it wasn't, and I was slipping into my trance. I came into my room. I was lying on the bed for a single transcendent moment. I convinced myself that it was just some horrible nightmare. The idea deteriorated into like ash when I sat up and realized that my hands were stained with crimson red. I watched an utter revolu- revulsion as I made my first and made a fist and winced in pain at the electric in my hands. The caked blood crumbled in t- from my fist. It felt like I had fractured a few bones in my hand. I knew that I was I had lost control to whatever that thing has was and done. I washed the blood off my hands, revealing gr- bruised knuckles underneath, and tried to understand everything. I realized what was happening. Our idea was using a white horse as a pavilonian trigger to make it easier to put me into a trance state and horribly backfired. Now any extent thought of the white horse was enough to put me into a trance state and let that thing take control. I can think of it only a few seconds before I start to feel like I'm losing control. I'm still not sure what I did in my last trance state, I, but I have an idea of who the target was. On my email account, I had sent an email out to Teresa a few hours ago while I was still in a trance state. I don't want to know what happened. I have enough clues to piece it together. My fists are bruised and sore. I am missing a hank of hair on my head. I had a long scratch starting at the base of my neck and trailed down to my chest. And I got sick a few minutes ago and I vomited up a pint of reddish substance and a bunch of curled up pages of a small book. It didn't take long to connect the indigested pages to a red book where I had been keeping my thesis notes. They were soggy and intelligible and from soaking in my gastric feed with a few hours. I opened up the red book to see if there was anything left and that I might be able to give me some evidence for police or these absurd events. But there was nothing except a few pages left. Any, anything I knew now will make seem 
raving mad. I can't go to the police or they'll lock me away. There are a few pages left in the red journal. They all have the same phrase written on them. Repeated improvement mantra. I'm here now. I'm here now. I'm here now. I realize now that the humunculus that Abbott thought was taking control of my life and is now vicious urges. I have no doubt that my thesis has probably been erased from my computer. Should I go check it? My only hope is to go as long as I can without thinking of it and hoping that it fades away. The passing of time should lessen the effects of it. Like I had once read in a Louvre technique that I used to condition ultraviolet youth in England, and I had physically nauseated to react to violence. In those studies, the polvulin effect only lasted a few weeks, and I was I still have a change to lose myself in these subconscious desires. Days have passed. I have holed myself up in my room and I now realize how much of a fool I have been. I thought that I could escape falling into a trance state by not thinking of my trigger word, but that is foolish. If you remember a me the mental game I asked you to play earlier you and knew the mechanics, you would realize how foolish of a thought it was. I tried to distract myself from the white horse trigger by thinking of other things, but that was the only thing that this different thought would imagine a white horse. Now, I know that every thought is like a chain that leads back to the trigger words that are capable of sending me into a trance state. My rapture is approaching me like a wave, and there is nothing I can do to stop it. It's not going away. Every thought is starting to make me feel tired, and I'm growing tired of the mental cat and mouse. I have a feeling that the next time I go under, I will wake in a jail cell. I will find out what the world after death is like, and worst of all, I will never come out of under the omnicolous control. I am tired of fighting it. I have been awake for days now. There is a line of music rattling around in my head, and it's effectively catchy. And I feel myself growing weary by the second. Where is that song coming from? Here I lay, still and breathless, just like always. Still I want some more. Mirror sideways, who cares what's behind, just like always. Still your passenger. I am here.